The word Indian, which of course lends itself to the state of Indiana, is originally derived from the Sanskrit word Sindhu, meaning river. The specific river it refers to is the Indus in Southeast Asia. In the 15th century, Europeans used the word India to refer to virtually all of Southeast Asia. So when Christopher Columbus stumbled upon some islands in 1492 in his attempt to circumnavigate the globe, he believed he was in India. His error has framed the way we talk about Native Americans ever since. It's a little hard to pin down, but arguably 29 of our current 50 states have names that can be associated with Native Americans. And while some of them actually gasp, name the places that those indigenous people used for them, many do not. Most of the names were placed by people, sometimes Europeans, sometimes Washington politicians, who didn't know or care what the words meant, or what words might already be associated with the land they were naming. All of the names, however, have stories behind them, and those are the stories I will tell in this video. So, welcome, and let's get started. Massachusetts and Connecticut were adopted early by Puritans who lived among the people who placed those names, although if Captain John Smith of Virginia fame had had his way, they would not have had the chance. He explored the New England coast in 1614 and took his map, complete with the names he took from the natives he met, back to Prince Charles in England and asked him, please to change their barbarous names for such English which is how we have the Charles River and Cape Ann. But for the most part, the Puritans had the good sense to go with the indigenous names. Mississippi and Ohio were both named for rivers that held on to the names applied to them by natives. Mississippi, the word, comes from the Ojibwa tribe living near the northern reaches of the Great River, but names a state at the far southern end of the river where the natives had a completely different word for it, something like Malbuchia. God, I'm so sorry about my pronunciations. Ohio was an Iroquois word, which is usually translated as beautiful river. Unfortunately, beginning in the 20th century, that river is often designated as the nation's most polluted. The word Wisconsin was mistranslated for many years, but 21st century research by a historical linguist named Michael McCafferty appears to confirm that it is a Miami word, meaning river running through a red place, referring to the Wisconsin Dells. The words Missouri, Kansas, and Iowa all name rivers and tribes who were living on them when encountered by European explorers. All, however, are exonyms, or names given by neighboring tribes, and not their names for themselves. As exonyms, all of these names probably had other meanings that were descriptive of the people they named. Missouri, for instance, is generally defined as the people who make dugout canoes. Kansas, as any rock music fan can tell you, is often defined as people of the south wind. The word Iowa, however, has been lost to time. The definition claimed by the tribe is people of the gray snow, but even they say that the definition of the word has been lost. Some of the other translations that have been offered are dusty noses, sleepy ones, and those who speak gibberish. But as Kansas author William Unrau states, for those tribes, the words are simply what others call them and have no particular meaning. Arkansas is also an exonym. It was applied by the French, which is why it has that silent S at the end. Illinois was similarly named by the French, but is, in a rare case, not an exonym, but the name that a confederation of tribes in the Mississippi Valley, including the Cahokia, Peoria, and others, actually used for themselves. The word Michigan named the lake that it still names today, and is probably derived from the same root as Michilimackinac, a word about which historian Bruce Catton delivers one of my favorite state name quotes. It is a stumbling block for anyone who writes or talks about Michigan. There are innumerable ways to spell it. There is argument over its meaning, and there is no logic whatever to its pronunciation, on top of which it does not stay put properly as a historic place should. Oregon was originally believed to be a Spanish word, but thanks to new research is now believed to have originated as an indigenous word used to describe a kind of fish oil that was produced in that region. 
Conversely, the word Arizona was believed originally to be indigenous, but is now thought to come from Basque, a language in northern Spain. The word Idaho, about which I have a whole video in the making, was originally thought to be Native American, but is almost certainly a made-up word. And I'm just going to leave that one there as a teaser for my Idaho video. The word Texas comes from the Hasinai people living near the Sabine River. The word was a friendly greeting, often translated as, hello friend. I guess now we might retranslate it as... What's funny is that Texas names an area that includes dozens of other tribes and languages who have their own damn greetings, thank you very much. The origin of the word Kentucky has been so lost to time that researchers aren't even certain what language it is derived from. It was, however, used to label the valley south of the Ohio River that it still names today. The word Tennessee is Cherokee and is believed to have been the name of a small village that grew to importance after the Cherokee began associating with Europeans. It would be difficult to excavate that village now, though, because in 1979, the region where that town was believed to exist was flooded with the building of the Teleco Dam. Alabama was named for a river which was named for the people who lived on that river, but was only applied to the state decades after that native tribe had picked up and moved west to Texas. Nebraska is the Native American name for a river that runs through the state, but the river ultimately kept the name the French had given it, Platte. Both Platte, a French word, and Nebraska, an Oto word, mean flat, because, yeah. Until it was purchased by the U.S. in 1867, Alaska had been referred to as Russian America. The word Alaska was the Aleut word, or as close as English speakers could get to it, for mainland, which is funny because the state of Alaska includes hundreds of islands, which is the reason they needed a word for mainland. Then there are the Sandwich Islands, which thankfully reclaimed their own historical name, Hawaii, when the kingdom adopted its first constitution in 1840. In 1887, however, a group of white businessmen, including famously Sanford B. Dole of pineapple fame, succeeded in initiating a coup against the king of Hawaii, forcing him to sign what has since been dubbed the Bayonet Constitution. In 1900, Hawaii was annexed as a territory by the United States, and in 1959 it was made a state. Fortunately, we kept the ancient indigenous name. Many congressmen in the 1800s and well, I guess certain politicians today, had little regard or respect for the natives of America. We birthed a nation from nothing. I mean, there was nothing here. I mean, yes, we have Native Americans, but... If Some of them even seemed to believe there was one Indian language as opposed to dozens, maybe hundreds of languages and dialects. This was illustrated when a certain Senator Colomer, when confronted with the aforementioned word Idaho, exclaimed, quote, I do not understand Indian. This phenomenon might explain the use of the word Wyoming to name a western state. The word is Munsi, a dialect of the Lenape natives on the east coast, and described a certain valley in what is now Pennsylvania. But when in need of a name for a territory that was created mostly to keep it out of the clutches of the Mormons, Congress eschewed words that were actually affiliated with the region, words like Shoshone or Cheyenne, and chose Wyoming as if any Indian word would do. New Mexico is often not included as a Native American name, but it absolutely qualifies. The Mexica were a division of the Aztecs who had built the great city of Tenochtitlan, today's Mexico City. After the Spanish conquest of Mexico, they began to explore further north, looking for lands that would be just as lucrative. New Mexico was applied rather aspirationally then. Ironically, the prejudices against the Mexicans and Native Americans who lived in the region and the fact that it was largely poor and rural kept New Mexico from achieving statehood until 1912. William Tecumseh Sherman even famously remarked once that the U.S. ought to declare war on Mexico and make it take New Mexico back. But as prejudiced as some lawmakers were toward Native Americans, that is nothing compared to the contempt in which they held Mormons. When Brigham Young and the other disciples of Joseph Smith chose to claim the region surrounding the Great Salt Lake and make it their own, 
Congress was alarmed and not a little ticked off at the presumption that legislators would just rubber stamp decisions made by a group they considered to be a religious cult. While most of the negotiations surrounding statehood came down to the unacceptable practice, as far as Congress was concerned, of polygamy, there was also a huge disagreement about the name. The Mormons named their new home Desiree and wanted that to be the name of their new state. But Thomas Hart Benton, a fierce opponent of the Mormons, insisted on Utah. And in reading the history, it's at least plausible that he was largely motivated out of sheer spite. Few Native American tribes are as misunderstood with regard to their government and divisions as the Dakotas and their larger nation, the... Hang on. Oteti Shakomi Oyate. Who we call the much easier to pronounce Sioux. But alas, when the Americans wanted a name for the land that would be created west of Minnesota, they used the name of the native people who lived in Minnesota and whose language had provided the name for the Minnesota River and state, the Dakotas. Tragically, a year after Dakota Territory was created, relations broke down between Indian agents and the Dakota tribe, sparking the Dakota War of 1862. Following great loss of life on both sides, the Americans tried and executed 38 Dakota prisoners in the largest mass public execution in American history, and the rest of the tribe were driven onto reservations in, yes, Dakota Territory. In a scene reminiscent of the Trail of Tears, the Dakotas were forced from their homelands in Minnesota, creating what is usually referred to as the Dakota Diaspora. The last of the Native American state names is Oklahoma. The word is Choctaw, which is a Muskegon dialect, and it represents the only time that American politicians actually asked indigenous people what they want to call their land. Reverend Alan Wright, representing the Choctaw Nation, one of the so-called five civilized tribes, answered immediately, Oklahoma. And while some of the other nation's representatives objected, no other name was proposed, and so Oklahoma it was. The word means red people in the Choctaw language, and the state is currently home to reservations belonging to many, if not most, of the descendants of the people who gave us the other names I've talked about in this video. Our states are like little sisters. No one is allowed to criticize them except those who actually claim them as their own. Any Texan will defend Texas just as vehemently as any Ohioan will champion Ohio. But many of those states' names are accidents of history or were placed according to the whims of men who knew nothing about the regions they were labeling or the words they were using to do said labeling. I've given only the briefest of details about the indigenous words that our forebears used to label the land under our feet, and I'm gratified that new research is being done on these words all the time. If you'd like more detail, I uploaded my book that I published in 2009. It's free no ads. But if you want to support my channel, you can buy a hard copy or donate to my Patreon. Anyway, the link is in the description, so go crazy.